how do we symbolize only dogs are cute? We actually know the answer to this already. We know that we can just ignore the word only, and then we just think, okay, how do I symbolize dogs are cute? Well, dogs is the group, cute is the property, no problem, for all x, dx, arrow, cx. Very straightforward. And then when I actually get rid of the only, it is really just swapping the antecedent and the consequent here. Uh, and another way of thinking about it is it's swapping the thing that we're talking about. The subject of this sentence, only dogs are cute, actually isn't about dogs at all. It's actually about things that are cute. And it's saying, if you're cute, then you must be a dog. So that is sort of like a natural way of understanding only. It fits with what we know from sentential logic perfectly, no problem. Now, another way is that you could think that the group is something different. If I say only dogs are cute, you could think that this is about something that is not a dog. So the group here, what we're really talking about are things that aren't dogs. So if only dogs are cute, then what is the property about everything that's not a dog? Well, the property is that they're not cute. And that's also a very straightforward way of symbolizing. Now, we've seen this again. This is a contrapositive form, but we never really understood really why it worked that way. It makes a lot of sense in predicate logic because I'm changing what I think the group is of the sentence away from cute things to things that aren't dogs. Uh, I could also change this again to say that I'm talking about no non-dog, and then the property is cute, so no non-dog is cute, and then I get at something like this. It's not the case that there is something that is not a dog and cute. That's the same thing as saying only dogs are cute. Now, how did I arrive at this one? Well, from our quantifier negation video, you can actually see that these are logically equivalent. The second and the third one, they're logically equivalent. And it's, of course, equivalent with the first one. So these are all good. So there's nothing strange or really new about the word only in this example. And this is how we will tackle only in single place predicate logic. Unfortunately, there are some problems with the word only in predicate logic. And these problems are a problem of reference. They're not really a problem of understanding what only is saying. So if I say the sentence, only breaded cats are cute, the question is, what is the only modifying? It seems that I have options. I, I could be modifying breaded, or I could be modifying breaded cats, or I could mo be modifying something else, and it's a bit unclear. So let's just look at these two options. So here's an example where the only is going to modify breaded and not the cat's part. Okay, so I'm basically just stipulating this to be the case. Only breaded cats are cute. And when I say it that way, the paraphrase of this is pretty straightforward. Paraphrasing is your friend whenever you're trying to figure out something that's complicated. The paraphrase of this is to say, among cats, so when we're talking about cats, only the breaded ones are cute. So what this is saying is it could be that a dog is cute. I don't know. I'm not making claim, I'm not worrying about dogs, but I'm saying when I'm considering cats, only the breaded ones have this property of cuteness. So to do this, I'm going to do my first restriction of my group. And so I say for all x, ax, arrow. What this is saying is that the only thing I'm talking about are my for all x, ax, everything that is a cat. Now I can bestow the property that once I'm talking about cats, only the breaded ones are cute. And we can tackle that in the standard way that we understand the word only. So I'm saying, if you're cute, then you are breaded. And that makes pretty good sense. Of course, the same variants apply that we saw from our first example. And we can even do a little bit of exportation. So maybe you got a slightly different answer. Uh, but here, this bottom one says, for anything that is a cat and not breaded, well, then you're not cute. And what about all the other things? Don't know, we're ma not making any fancy claims about other things. Okay, lots of variants out there. It doesn't matter. They're all fine as long as we capture that this is about breaded as the modified by the only and not anything else. Now we can look at another example then where it's breaded cats that is being modified by the only. Only breaded cats are cute. And in fact, this is just like the dog example to start off with. And this says the only things that are cute are breaded cats. And so again, there's no real complication about this. We just have to make sure that the thing that is cute are the breaded cats. So the first one is for me the most natural. It says if you're cute, then you are a breaded cat. And that's just that. So are dogs cute? No, dogs are not breaded cats, so they're not cute. So what we're having here is an ambiguity with only in terms of what it's modifying. 
is is it modifying sort of the full complex group or is it modifying just the property of the group? And this is tough. Is it breaded or breaded cats? How do we know? Unfortunately, the answer to how we know is mostly in terms of context. And so this is problematic for us because this course is not a course about context. I don't want any question to be asked of you that requires you to know some background knowledge that you may or may not possess in order to figure out what it is that I'm asking you. So uh, we in this class will never try to trick you, but this is more of a lesson of just regular everyday life. You need to be careful with the word only, and now you know why. It turns out that only is problematic for other reasons beyond all the things that we've learned so far in the course. And I think this is just a nice place to mention it, but I'm not actually going to tackle these things just yet, and I'll explain why in a moment. So this is not my example. This example was sort of uh, went around Reddit uh, several years back and sort of was popular in, I, I don't know, <laughs> popular is a relative term, uh, but it was uh, sort of on, online, and it's sort of a funny example. So here's a sentence. She told him that she loved him. And the task is, you can put the word only anywhere in the sentence. Only she told him that she loved him. She only told him that she loved him. She told only him that she loved him, etc., etc., all the way down the road. The last one is she told him that she loved only, uh, him only. Some of these uh, are the same as some of the other ones. It doesn't really matter. But the point is that only can go in any spot in the sentence, and it radically changes the meaning each time. And so this is hard when you're trying to figure out what the meaning is to symbolize, and only is just so tricky in that way. So the tip is to paraphrase, but if you want to try this out, this is actually a pretty interesting exercise, but we don't have the full tools to symbolize this yet. We will when we get to multiplace predicate logic. All right, let's look at a couple examples uh, of, of uh, sort of all more oddities that could be ambiguous. So here is breaded cats, which are sad, and spherical dogs are strange. There's nothing too complicated about this. You can see that I have a non-restrictive clause, and that's which are sad, and then I have the word which, and just like always, I need to find out what the which is talking about. What I'm asking is essentially, what is the referent of the word which? So what is the subject? What is that word pointing to? Uh, so what is sad? Is it cats? or is it breaded cats? So you can see that it actually could just be cats. Maybe it's breaded cats, it's a bit unclear. Uh, in general though, we take the complex group as the referent of reference terms. So if I had a pronoun later on that said they, I would be talking about not cats, but breaded cats. And so this is sort of just an important tip. I'm not actually gonna bother symbolizing this, it's pretty straightforward. It's just a question of what is the correct subject for the non-restrictive clause. Uh, here's another example. Breaded cats and spherical dogs, which are strange, are cute. So here I moved that non-restrictive clause over, and uh, I still have the same question. What is strange? Is it just the spherical dogs, or is it the breaded cats? When I say breaded cats and spherical dogs, which are strange, it's a bit unclear. Unfortunately, in this example, I think the answer to this is really determined by context. So again, I don't want to ask questions like this on a test or anything, which are sort of tricky by nature. Uh, and this is sort of just something I'm pointing out so you know in regular English usage, this can be a bit ambiguous. We're going to finish this video by looking at some of the problem variants that I highlighted earlier in my stylistic variants of the universal and the existential. And these problem variants are problematic because it's sort of ambiguous. It can be the case that the word the, a, any, some sometimes mean a universal, sometimes mean an existential, and this can pose some problems. So let's look at our first one. A cat is a scary animal. This type of usage, when I use the word a and I introduce a subject in a sort of general sense, a cat is a scary animal, this is actually a standard way of invoking a universal statement. Uh, it's sort of saying like a bicycle is something that has two wheels, or a square is a blah, 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 four-sided rectangle with the same sides. This type of generalized usage of the word A invokes a universal claim, and that's sort of the standard way of interpreting it. Unfortunately, we can also come up with sentences that actually look the same in structure, but aren't 
a universal. So I can say a cat is lying on my keyboard, and that seems to be an existential. So we have the problem that the word a can be a universal or existential. And the question is, how can I tell the difference? How do I know which one is which? So one way to tell is that you have to ask the question, can I replace the word a with each or every? If I can, then it's some sort of universal claim. So the first one, I can say, every cat is a scary animal. Yeah, that seems to work. But the second one says, every cat is lying on my keyboard. Well, that's not what I mean. But how do I really know that's not what I mean? You know, like this is, this is a tricky thing and it requires a bit of contextual knowledge. So I find this sort of a problematic example. And you can even come up with a sentence that doesn't really have a, a clear answer to, can you replace it with this or that? So I can say a dodo is not alive right now. This seems to be possibly universal, possibly an existential. It's a tough one. And so this is a bit ambiguous. The word the, which is the definite descriptor word, is also uh, a problematic in this way. If I say the mouse stole the cheese, that seems to be invoking a singular mouse. So I'm talking about that one. That's an existential claim. Uh, pretty straightforward. But then I can say the mouse is a gross animal. And in this sense, I'm actually talking about the mouse as some sort of like universal sort of property of it or some sort of group. And this is similar to how I could say like a cat is a scary animal. The mouse is a gross animal. And in this sense, it's a universal. This is, again, unfortunate. The word the can be a universal or existential. And I can come up with the exact same thing. Can you replace the with each or every? But unfortunately, there's just something about this that isn't satisfying because you can have an example like the mouse is gross and it's actually unclear if I mean the existential or the universal generalized claim. So this too is problematic. Uh, I find this one particularly annoying, the word any. Uh, any student who studies will pass. What do I mean by that? Well, I'm actually sort of making some sort of claim about students and passing in general. So I mean this to apply to anything that's a student, which is a universal claim. That does seem straightforward. But I can use any in a slightly different context, and it doesn't appear to be universal. I can say, if any student passes, I will be happy. And this clearly isn't saying, if every single student passes, I will be happy. It's saying, if at least one student passes, if some student passes, I will be happy. And this is obviously an existential. So again, any can be a universal or existential, depending on the context, and you can ask the same questions. Can you replace any with each or every? Can you replace any with at least one? But I think this one is also very contextually based, and so any is a difficult word uh, when you're trying to figure it out if you don't have a strong intuition about it one way or another. The last one I'm going to look at is this word sum. Again, if I say some rectangles are squares, this just seems to be an existential no problem. Some, the, the definition of existential is to say there is something that. So some invokes the existential. But there are sort of maybe somewhat awkward ways of using the word some that don't invoke an existential at all. So I can say if some rectangle has sides of the same length, then it is a square. Uh, who would say this? I don't know. Maybe a math textbook would say something like this. Uh, but Notice here that I'm talking about a general notion of a rectangle, and so this is actually a universal. So this is also awkward. Some can be a universal or an ex existential, and the thing you're trying to look for is does some mean some like generic member of the group that I'm talking about? So if some rectangle is some abstract generic member, then it's universal. And so you, at this point, you might just be like, what are you talking about? If you're a math student, you probably know a little bit about what I mean just from your history of doing math. But we actually don't really have the tools quite yet to understand what I mean about this generic member. But we will soon. In the next unit of this course, we'll start to really sort of dig at what this means and how we can use this to generate a universal claim. The key concepts here are that uh, I'm not trying to trick you. <laughs> And so I know that may be hard to see, see because I just went through all these like difficult things where I said it could be this, could be that, I don't know. Um, but I'm doing this because I want you to know that there's ambiguous reference and ambiguous stylistic variants in the English language. And so you have to be careful about that, especially with the word only and so on, non-restrictive non clauses, etc. 
But in general, I'm not trying to trick you when it comes to actually assessing your skills in logic on a test or anything like that. So I'll have lots more to say about this in class, uh, but for now, I think this is just good stuff to sort of think about and really focus on trying to pin down what the reference of certain terms mean. Coming up next, we're going to look at some logical equivalencies and just talk about them pretty quickly.